All right, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So we have uh, come to accept that in some appropriate sense, uh, entanglement builds space-time. The question I want to uh, ask today is how? And in particular, uh, what's the precise meaning of the word uh, build? In classical geometry, the way we think of building space-time, usually, uh, is by patching together little pieces of flat space. These are the tangent spaces of uh, the points on a base manifold. And the way we glue them together mathematically is by defining a connection. This serves as a map between, that aligns the local Lorentz frames that we defined on each of the tangent spaces. And as a result of uh, this uh, gluing of these little flat spaces, we get the curvature of the space-time. So an idea that, you, that one may find worth exploring is the possibility that the entanglement plays an analogous role for holographic space-times, a role analogous to the connection uh, in the usual uh, way of building uh, geometries. Now, in uh, ADS-CFT, we don't have access to this local structure, to the properties of the tangent spaces. Uh, we don't have the conceptual or computational tools to address these questions. But there was, there's another development that has been put on firm ground in the recent years, and this is subregion duality. And this allows us to talk about uh, physics in a different piece of space, the entanglement wedge. It's a piece of space that is uh, selected by uh, a Ryuta Kaganagi surface, and it is, uh, it is defined as the part of space-time that is space-like separated from the RT surface. In that case, I'm drawing a three-dimensional figure because that's the best I can do. And the RT surface is this geodesic that uh, connects two points on the boundary. But the discussion will be general. And the statement of the subregion duality is that I can reconstruct physics in that part of space by having access to information in a particular subregion in the CFT. And I'm meaning something very precise here. The geometry, the state of the bulk fields, and the dynamics of local operators in the entanglement wedge can be reconstructed by having access to the state and the algebra of operators localized in the corresponding subregion on the boundary. I can do this separately for every entanglement wedge. I can independently reconstruct every entanglement wedge. But all these wedges are parts of the same global space-time. They can overlap, they can contain each other, so they clearly satisfy certain consistency relations. Similarly, all the states of the reduced, uh, of the subregions are all, all descend from the same global wave function for the CFT. So this suggests that maybe we can think of trying to build spacetime by appropriately describing how we can glue together the entanglement wedges and the states of the subregions respectively. The first claim that I'll make today is that uh, one can uh, describe the relations between entanglement wedges uh, by, talking, uh, by introducing a connection, a geometric connection for them. By talking about the connection, I'm implicitly referring to some sort of gauge symmetry. A gauge symmetry in the space of wedges, in the space of entanglement wedges. The gauge symmetry will be essentially different morphism invariants. Uh, the physics in each of uh, these entanglement wedges is invariant under the action of diffeomorphisms. Now, the action of most of these diffeomorphisms is trivial because uh, the, uh, the charges, the generators, vanish on the physical phase space as a result of the constraint equations. But there are some diffeomorphisms that, from the perspective of the subregion, they look non trivial. These are the ones that don't fall fast enough as we approach the boundaries. Here we have two boundaries the asymptotic ADS boundary and the RT surface, the diffeomorphisms that will become the gauge symmetries in the space of wedges will be the diffeomorphisms that asymptote that have non-trivial profile on the RT surface. These have been called the edge modes. And uh, the curvature of this connection in the space of wedges uh, will probe the curvature, the bulk curvature in the vicinity of the RT surface. Now this is a mathematical statement but the physical statement I want to make that I believe underlies this construction is that microscopically, 
What determines this connection, the gluing conditions between entanglement wedges, is the entanglement structure of the CFT. In fact, I will make a stronger claim, and I will say that uh, entanglement should be thought of as a connection in general in quantum mechanics. It's a connection between subsystems of the quantum state. If I have a system and I decompose it to subsystems, each of the subsystems has a, has a reduced state. The gauge symmetry that I'm talking about will be the, lock, the symmetries of the subsystems, things that leave the density matrix of a subsystem invariant. Each of the subsystems has its own symmetry, and entanglement, I will explain, serves as a map between the frames of the subsystems. I will describe the physical idea, and then I will describe how you can formulate it in the CFT, in ADS-CFT in particular. There, the subsystems will be the subregions of the CFT, and uh, uh, the state of the subregions is usually mo most conveniently described in terms of the modular operators. So this entanglement connection that I'm talking about here in the CFT will be a connection, a Berry connection for the modular Hamiltonians uh, of the state. These two stories, I argue, are linked to each other. The Berry connection for the modular Hamiltonians will probe the, uh, will be related under ads -CFT to this connection for entanglement wedges, and the link will be the JLMS relation, which allows me to rewrite the CFT modular Hamiltonian uh, as a bulk quantity. This is what I'm going to talk about. And I want to start by by talking about this idea that entanglement should be, should be thought of as a connection in the simplest case possible. Consider two qubits. Alice has a qubit A in her, in her lab. Bob has a qubit B. They can, each of them can perform an operation on, their, on the qubit that they have, and they're in, in an entangled state. In fact, in a maximally entangled state. Wij is the coefficients uh, i and j are summed over. You can keep a specific example in your mind, up, up, plus down, down, with some relative phase. Now, if I ask Alice or Bob what's the orientation of their spin, which way does it point, the answer is it's completely indefinite. The density matrix that Alice uh, and Bob individually have is a maximally mixed density matrix, and it's invariant under any unitary transformation. This means that all the expectation values that Alice will measure let's say the expectation value of some spin operator is invariant under the action of a unitary, under, which is, in this case is just a rotation in space. Sigma alpha has the same, sigma a has the same expectation value as sigma tilde of a. And similarly for Bob. However, because these two systems are entangled in a global state, correlations of sigma a and sigma b are not invariant under the independent unitary rotation of a and b. This means that the global state makes the relative frame, the relative unitary frame between the two spins, physically meaningful. It's the relative orientation. Another way of thinking about it is that this entangled state defines a map between a state in Alice's Hilbert space and a state in Bob's. Written in terms of some bases, Wij, the coefficients that appear over there, serve as this map between the bases. And for this reason, I want to think of this Wij as a Wilson line, an entanglement Wilson line. It transforms as a Wilson line, as an open Wilson line that connects A and B. It's easy to see the transformation from, from the definition. And it does the same role as a connection usually does, relates two frames. At this point, I just gave you a name uh, for something that you have seen a billion times in your lives. So let's now do something with it. Uh, let's now again consider Alice and Bob sharing an entangled state. Now we give, the, we give Alice an extra system, an extra spin, 5C. This is a spin in some specific state. It points in some direction in space. Alice and Bob can use that system in order to align the reference frames. How would they do that? Well, one way is that we imagine Alice and Bob are physicists in some physics department, so they, they work in nearby labs. They can take 5C from one lab to the other. Now they share a spin. And they can use this to orient their frames, to align them, to say, let's agree that this is our z direction. This is one way in which this can be done, in which they can align their frames, operational way. But there's another way. Alice can attempt to teleport her state 
the state phi to Bob. She would do this by performing a measurement, a joint measurement on her system A and system C. The measurement has, Alice doesn't have access to the particular, doesn't have knowledge of the particular state she's sharing with Bob, so she has to perform a measurement in a particular basis that she chose, a predetermined basis, a bell basis of her liking. Given the result of Alice's measurement, Bob needs to perform a particular operation on his spin to reconstruct the state. But what Bob will find is that the state that he reconstructs is not the state that Alice was trying to send him, it's a transformed state. It is the map of the state phi through the entangled state that I was showing you in the previous slide. It is the state phi dressed with a Wilson line W. So if I want to take the interpretation of W as a, as a Wilson line seriously, then what this process did is that it took the state phi, it transported it from A to B while simultaneously dressing it with a Wilson line. So teleportation in that case should be thought of Maybe it suggests that teleportation should be thought of as on equal footing as parallel transport. The two legs in this process should be thought of as on equal physical footing. Or at least that's what this picture suggests. If I do this, then I can think of these two processes as the process of taking a state and parallel transporting it through different paths and comparing the results. And given that the results are, are uh, different, the comparison of the two defines a holonomy, in this case a holonomy induced by the entanglement structure of the state. <coughs> now, a comment at this point is important. If you want to be conservative, what I'm describing to you uh, is, uh, can be understood as follows. I'm employing a geometric notion, the notion of a connection and a parallel transport, in order to characterize the structure of entanglement. In this case, the structure of entanglement is precisely these coefficients w, i, j with their phases and everything. So I'm just introducing a geometric notion to characterize this, to probe that structure. However, it is interesting to consider the possibility that this should be thought of as a physical statement. In light of ER equals ZPR and the gauge jafferis wall protocol for making traversable wormholes, for those of you who are familiar with it, this suggests, this is perhaps another, uh, maybe a statement that deepens that relation between uh, transport and teleportation, the structure of entanglement, and parallel transport. Is that yes. So I, I think of parallel transport as an invertible operation, but this W in general will not be in the vertical matrix. This is a maximally entangled state in this case. Uh, okay, you just say this, we're, we're only going to consider maximally entangled. For this toy example, I'm considering a maximally entangled state. We'll, we'll make a, a, we'll formulate this idea more properly later, but for this toy example, W is a maximally entangled state. <laughs> The, the state that they share is a maximal integral state. W is unitary. Yes, that's right. But generally, uh, system A, B is not the field, right? Uh, here I'm, talk I'm taking a particular case that I like. Uh, it, is a, it is a state, an entangled state of A, a maximally entangled state of A and B. I agree that in general you can consider more general systems. Uh, if you're interested in, in how you formulate this idea more mathematically, I will do this right after this toy example. This is to illustrate the physical idea that uh, you can think of the symmetries of the reduced subsystems of a quantum state as, uh, as endowed with local symmetries. These are the symmetries of the individual density matrices and that the entanglement structure relates the frames of this. This is an illustration of the physical idea and not the mathematics. The, so, okay, let's go to the previous slide. So this defines for you the, good, so this is a. Is an a complex conjugation in an equation just above the red arrow? Right, so that, that comes in the choice of, so, good. So you can think of, what does, what does the teleportation do? So you have to perform, a, so now you have, previously we had system A and system B and we were mapping states of A to states of B, right? So here we have uh, A and C. So you can think of the measurement, the projection that Alice will perform 
uh, in some in the bell bases as a map as a means of mapping the state of uh, the state phi of C to a state of Alice's uh, state. So that is the difference between the two. So here you have to do another little loop. Uh, Right, yes. So this yeah. depends on the choice of bases. But the choice of bases is not allowed to depend on the state that they share. So this is fixed by convention. They, they agreed on a teleportation protocol, a means of communication, and they fixed that. And now that, and that, that's what they use to define the holonomies. It's that, the set of rules that I'm defining here. In this picture, yes. That's right. So this is an illustration of the physical idea. But let's now try to go back to uh, the question that I started with, how we can use this idea in order to perhaps understand uh, how to build spacetime by gluing entanglement wedges, and how this can be related to the entanglement structure. Uh, so for that, we need to do two things. We need to formulate this entanglement connection mathematically. And we need to explain, and we need to also formulate the connection in the space of entanglement wedges appropriately. So let's start with the subregion. This will be the subregions will be the subsystems in our case. So let's start with the subregion, the CFT. It has a state and has an algebra of localized operators, and that's dual to a particular entanglement wedge in, in the bulk selected by a corresponding RT surface. It has a geometry, and I'm picking for convenience in order to show you formulas, a particular gauge close to the RT surface. This is the orthonormal gauge. X alphas are the, uh, the orthogonal directions, and Y i's are the directions along the minimal surface. So the state, in, the best way to talk about the state of the subregion is by talking about the modular Hamiltonian. For those of you who, who are not familiar, is mine, whenever you have a density matrix, you can think of it as minus the logarithm of the density matrix. In general, this is a well-defined operator in, in QFT, so I will talk about this. And the important thing is that uh, we know something about the holographic dual of, uh, of the modular Hamiltonian. It is the area of the RT surface measured in, G, uh, in Planck units uh, plus the, uh, the modular Hamiltonian for the state of the bulk fields in the entanglement wedge. In general, this is a complicated operator, but we know we, there is one place where we have control over what it does. As I, when I go very close to the RT surface, it, it generates a geometric flow. It is a boost transformation, uh, which in the particular gauge I chose is, is this one. Now, this is not the statement about the action of, 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 the, eight, of the modular Hamiltonian everywhere in the entanglement wedge. It's in the neighborhood of the RT surface. So what are the local symmetries in that case, the symmetries of the subregion? Well, in the CFT, it will be uh, the operators, QI, that commute with the modular Hamiltonian. The Hermitian operators that generate an, a unitary flow that preserves the algebra, algebra of the subregion and its modular Hamiltonian. Now, what are the modular zero modes? These are the modular zero modes. That's how they have been called. What are the, uh, what are the corresponding uh, zero modes in the bulk? It will, it will be the zero modes of the bulk modular Hamiltonian, for which we can't say many things of interest, except in the neighborhood of the RT surface. There, their action will be a geometric a spacetime transformation that preserves the location and area of the RT surface and commutes with the modular flow via the vector Lie bracket. You can compute this, and uh, these are just boosts whose hyperbolic angle depends on the location of the RT surface. So local boosts along the RT surface and the feomorphisms along the directions of the RT surface. So these are the symmetries. Symmetries in the bulk, symmetries in the, on the boundary. These are the edge modes that we will gauge in the bulk. These are the zero modes that we will gauge in the CFT. Now, we want to now move up one layer in abstraction. We'll now consider the space of regions, the space of modular Hamiltonians. And this, is, this will be our base manifold. And we will fiber each point in that base manifold with uh, the zero modes in the, uh, in the case of the CFT, in the CFT picture, and the edge modes in the case of the, in the bulk picture. 
and we want to define a connection in that. Defining a connection mathematically means defining a means of going from one point in the base manifold to a nearby one in a horizontal direction, where horizontal means orthogonal to the fibers. So that is what we, we will do. So we'll start with a region described by some modular Hamiltonian. Lambda is a parameter that parameterizes the shape of the region, the corresponding entanglement wedge, and we'll perform an infinitesimal deformation of the region. Similarly, we'll move the entanglement wedge in some appropriate way, in the way so to the entanglement wedge of the new region. So we're looking now for the transport operator, the parallel transport. I'll call it V in the CFT. What's the properties that it needs to satisfy? Well, it needs to, take, it needs to move us on the base manifold. It needs to move us from modular Hamiltonian 1 to modular Hamiltonian 2. So it needs to satisfy that equation. In the bulk, we're looking for a transformation that will take one minimal surface to the next. So it's a geometric transformation close to the art surface. But at the same time, it needs to satisfy the same equation. It needs to map, to map the modular flow of the first region to the modular flow of the next. So this is the statement that V or Xi needs to move us in the base manifold. But what will the horizontal transport be? The horizontal transport, clearly here, V and Xi are defined only up to zero mode contributions. If I add to V some combination of uh, zero modes in either side, since they commute with H mode, they respect this equation. Horizontal transport speaks a specific way of doing that transport. The horizontal condition, the orthogonality to the gauge directions, in the CFT will be the, uh, the statement that we project out the zero mode component. In the CFT, we can do this by defining formally a projector. It can be written formally as this, as this integral over all modular flow. Effectively, what this does is that it takes the operator V and it projects, it projects, it picks out the diagonal in the modular eigenbases. And we want to set this to zero. These are, remember, the zero modes are the gauge, the things that we're gauging. So the projection is precisely the statement that we're gauging them. One subtlety is that uh, we want to project out the anti-Hermitian piece in the conventions that I used. Uh, because this is, the one that, uh, this is the one that generates a unitary transformation, according to my equation above. Not the, the Hermitian piece will, generate, will change the spectrum, and therefore it's a physical transformation. That is a subtlety. But, but this is the definition of the horizontal transport there. What is the horizontal transport in the case of, uh, uh, for the entanglement wedges? Remember there, the gauge directions are deferromorphins along the artist surface and local boosts in the neighborhood. So we have to demand that the horizontal transport is orthogonal to the RT surface. And its first orthogonal derivative satisfies that requirement, which projects out the boost component of, of the flow. <coughs> all in all, in the CFT, we define a special V that takes a subregion with its modular operator and its algebra and maps it to a nearby subregion to its modular operator and subalgebra, a transport of the, of the subalgebras in the CFT. In the bulk, what this does is that it defines a special flow between the RT surfaces. For those of you who are not familiar with the notion of horizontal transport, it, the equivalent statement will be saying that an equivalent way of saying this is that what the connection does, the ordinary connections that we use, they measure how far away we are from horizontal transport. When I move from one place, from one place in my fiber bundle to another one, the connection measures how far away I am from the horizontal direction. So it's kind of saying that the connection is the zero mode component of V or of Xi. Clearly, that's not, clearly I can shift it. So this is the gauge symmetry. But this is the statement that the connection is the zero mode of this transport operator. <coughs> An interesting thing to note is that uh, when these conditions for horizontal transport are, are satisfied in the bulk, the, it is essentially the statement that this transformation that takes one entanglement wedge to the other does not induce, induce any change in the nether charge associated to this edge mode. So 
then the change of the nether charge is essentially the connection in the space of entanglement wedges. Now, because of the fact that uh, this, the discussion has been slightly formal uh, in the case of the CFT, I'll, I'll quickly flash the two cases in which we can compute, we can solve these equations, we can define this horizontal transport in the CFT. These are for uh, ball-shaped regions in the vacuum or for null deformations. In ball-shaped regions of the vacuum, uh, we can use conformal symmetry to do that. And uh, for null deformations, we can, use a, we can apply the modular inclusion theorem in order, to derive, in order to derive this transport. And the transport operator is the shape derivative of the modular Hamiltonian over 2 pi i. In case you lost me the details, the point I wanted to make is that quantum states have curvature. It is a curvature that is associated with the, uh, with the modular Hamiltonian, with the entanglement structure. And we probed it by, by, by understanding the relations between modular Hamiltonians of different bipartitions. It's a curvature of the connection in the space of modular Hamiltonians of a given state. And I argued by using my only link between the two sides was the JLMS relation. I argued that this should be thought of as related to the geometric connection uh, for entanglement wedges in the bulk. That connection was formalized, was, that, that latter connection in the bulk was a map between the edge mode frames of two different entanglement wedges analogously to, to what the local connection does, where it defines a map between local Lorentz frames of nearby tangent spaces. Here, with the frame is the edge mode frame, and the, the points are the entanglement wedges. Yes? Do you get a full bar curvature or just a normal bundle curvature? I am, I, I am probing, I, yeah, I am probing the curvature in this way, in that holonomies of that connection I'm defining. I, are, I depend on the curvature of the bulk. I'm not reconstructing the curvature in any way. So I want to uh, leave you with a comment. And allow me to dream for 30 seconds. There is some sense in which gravity describes aspects of quantum mechanics. At least that's what ADS-CFT seems to say. What, when viewed as a mathematical statement, uh, this is a, the statement that computations on one side can be expressed in, as computations on the other side. Uh, but general relativ relativity is a, theory of, is a physical theory. It's founded on very specific principles, the principle of relativity and a principle of equivalence. So one may ask, what kind of aspects of quantum physics do these foundational principles capture? Do they capture universal aspects of quantum physics, of all quantum systems, or do they capture specific properties, approximate properties of specific systems? In the first case, we're looking at the deep connection between the two theories, perhaps unexpected connection. In the other case, we're classifying the types of systems that can have a gravitational description. So I take the results I presented to you today as being suggestive that quantum mechanics is endowed with its own relativity principle. It is a relativity principle which becomes manifest once we look at the quantum system from the perspective of its subsystems. Each subsystem has its local symmetry, and the entanglement structure defines the relativity map between the local frames. Is this a silly comment or a step towards deepening the connection between gravity and quantum mechanics? I don't know. Time will show. For the time being, thank you very much. And uh, this is the list of uh, my collaborators with the papers where you can uh, find more information about this work. Thanks.